record, like forgiven. Oh no, we forgot to record. Um, <laughs> okay, Alexis, uh, tell them, tell the recording what's on your mind. <laughs> I think the Hindu and Christian religion are different by based on how they treat people, especially women in a sense. Well, I know that Christians in the past have have used yes, the story Christians, of Adam and Eve to do some really nasty things. To yes, women. the Christians how they used Adam and Eve was just diabolical, cruel. Because everyone has a like lapse in life where evil has convinced them to do some un like some really bad stuff. But based on someone but we, uh but and if you see God, I remember he talked to a I don't know what the class safe term is. <laughs> Woman who has an a, a entertainment kind of job. <laughs> <laughs> the woman at the well, she had five husbands. How's that? Yeah. Um he was like, don't well, anyone who's perfect with no sin, then you can like throw a stone at her. Right. But everyone has had has done something. So no, so she was let let right, fully free. I think that if you have sin in your life, you can't judge someone's sin. Everyone has ups and downs in life. And I've always been told that that's God's that's God's plan, that he plans on making you have ups and downs. But if you if you're continuous in love for faith, love for God and your your faith will keep will like help you through it. That's a part of life. So when I read that Hindu men just hit women or like disrespect women because of sin, that really hurt. That like hurt me hearing that or well, reading that and just I could I personally would, I've always lived by the rule that a man should never hit a woman. Well, so you have I, to remember, talking. you do have to remember that there was plenty of that justified in Christianity. And there are plenty of Hindus that don't act that way, right? Mm -hmm. So just from a scholarly point of view, so I'm, I'm not criticizing specific Hindus at all. It's the scholarship. Mm -hmm. It's the way that a tradition gets passed down. So Christianity, to me, the, the Mary and Martha story is definitive, like that's it. That's how Jesus treats women. But that is not the history of Christianity at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so there, the history of it will include all sorts of awful things justified in the name of religion. My main point is that if this is truly spiritual, it has nothing to do with gender or sexuality, right? Those are all things related to our bodies. They're not the jiva. If we all have the same jiva, we shouldn't have any of these divisions based on class, gender, race, anything like that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, Alexis? It, it does. I completely agree that like the way my body is made and, and all that shouldn't affect how I'm treated. It shouldn't affect whether you have the Atman Brahman inside of you, <laughs> because you do, you are a piece of it. And so you have the same spiritual quest, you have the same capacity for liberation. That's, you know, all of that stuff. So that's my job as a teacher is just to make sure, you know, there are these patterns and you can end up wherever you want to end up. But I'm going to focus on what's similar because the world is going to tell you what's different. That's what they can see, right? That's what you hear about, you read about, you see with your eyes. So that's kind of my job. Um, who else wants to comment? Let's see. So Colin doesn't have comments. Ryan, um, did you have any comments on what you did read or see? Yeah, my over here is a pretty loud, but. One of the let me hold on. I just lost the dog over here. Um, nature provides joy and aesthetic satis uh, satisfaction. I actually really like that because, like, the Hawaiian culture talks a lot about nature, and I talked about this a few uh, like class periods ago. But for like Hawaiian culture, like, they believe that like the land isn't like just property, it's like a part of us, and you have to treat it with respect as if it's like a person, kind of. So, I thought that was interesting. That was the ind indigenous culture in Hawaii? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, okay. Um, oh, let's see. Zane, did you read the assignment for today? 
You mean like the readings or something else? Yeah, I mean, I read some of the readings and like just kind of a few things that stuck to me was one was like kind of how connected in Buddhism a uh, human is with nature and stuff like that. So I kind of found that pretty cool. And uh, just, just the connection there and it, it just talked a lot about it. So I just found that kind of interesting. And then also there was a quote that I saw. One second, let me pull it up. It is um, right here. Yeah, it says, as rain breaks through an ill-thatched house, passion will break through an unreflecting mind. And as rain does not break through a well-thatched house, passion will not break through a well-reflecting mind. And I found that pretty interesting, just that little quote right there. Did you look at the video at all? Uh, no, ma'am. I didn't get to go with the video today. I've been doing okay. quite a bit, but I did get to look at the reading some. Okay. So I'll show you. Actually, there's some pictures. There's a picture with an with a thatched house in it that I always have on the screen when I'm reading that. So I I did that on the pre-class, but if we have time, I'll do that today. Yes, ma'am. Um, Oh, uh, so Alyssa, did you want to chat anything? I don't know. What about who's left? Uh, Michael, do you have something? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, I can't hear you very well. Oh, can you hear me oh, better yeah. now? Yeah, I can hear you better now. Sorry, guys. You have to, you know, look at my face. Okay. Um, I don't have any comments from yesterday. I did not get to do yesterday's reading. Um, but I did have, so my first comment was from the, let's see, hold on. The Justice Men of Women. Um, uh, and they were talking about, like, well, I'll just read the quote for you. Um, uh, over against this kind of theology from below, we find religious ideas originating from privileged classes uh, that typically present a very different notions of liberation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I just kind of thought, I mean, obviously that is a true statement, but it kind of reminded me of, it kind of reminded me of um, like uh, when, when, Co and he went on to say like uh hold on he went on to say a theodicy of deservedness and that kind of reminded me of like when when covid was happening how a lot of like these fancy um private uh in like private schools um that like cost like forty thousand private high schools um how a lot of parents um like a lot of like privileged parents were like calling these schools and like sending letters and like cursing out this administration because their kids weren't going to school their kids were like having to stay home like everyone else and they thought that that was ridiculous that they essentially had to um they paid to, 40 like, grand and endure that you know um but it was like a big thing like i i i remember we actually read about it in like a in a class um hold on well yeah what i one of my questions is my kids went to an inner city school and they had the same intellectual level that anybody in a suburb school or a private school um i mean there's only so much stuff you can cram in a kid's head you know at any one time and right. so you know what you really what you really question is is this really about the intellectual part or is it about the social that you learn how to be comfortable around your own class? You know, how much of that is just all this subliminal stuff and you're one of the insiders and all this stuff has nothing to do with education. Does right. That, yeah. Well, basically, and there was some more information in like the articles that we read um, that talked about like uh, like substance abuse for for these for yeah. kids like private private uh, private schools and how like that happens a lot because uh, these parents are like these parents are like uh, they're, sorry there's uh, I'm dog sitting um, Lulu weird dog. 
Lulu. It's a toy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm, um, okay. So there was a lot of information. I almost think it was that like a lot of these, uh, these families, these, I mean, like really, really uppity families, they don't even really know how to parent anymore. That's you know? why the kid goes there. Cause the kid has problems. Right. They can't make it in the in the regular schools. Right. Um, so uh, I don't know if that little quote that's that reminded me of it. And then um, what Zane was talking about from, I think, the second reading, um, talking about the uh, like the interconnectedness with. Uh, with with nature, when they were talking about like the resources, basically, um, I apologize. Um, I, I just like that there was like a focus on like, uh, um, I don't know, talking about how like we, we need the earth, but the earth needs us, you know, a kind of like a, a, a partner, not, not a partnership, but anyway, I'm going to. Okay, you're going to the dogs, Michael. Um, Okay, anybody else? All right, so this is, oh, Alyssa did a chat here. Let's see what she's got. Um, the importance of being connected with the earth is really nice, makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, changing Buddhism to fit science. Why? Well, okay. Yeah, does the earth need us? Well, um, it needs us not to destroy it, but it will do, you know, it'll survive without us. Um, but it, you know, we can cripple it, but her, we can say. Uh, but anyway, so what I want to do then is divide the rest of the day into three parts. There's the art and the women and the environment. And I'll talk for a while. And then I want you to react each time. Okay. Um, I really like Zen Buddhist art. Um, and I recommend that if you ever get close to a museum where there is some, that you would go because you're standing in a room and these are huge, right? 20 foot by six feet. They're, they're truly gorgeous. And you really do get absorbed. And everybody in the room just becomes quiet because it's, you just can't make noise. It's, it's such an amazing experience. So I hope someday you'll be able to do that. Most major museums in cities have a have some Buddhist art. Okay, so this is, I just want you to think about to what extent is your own experience of religion related to art? Um, or your worldview, like how much do you reinforce your worldview through art, you know, um, sculpture or architecture or paintings or music or dance or literature. Anyway, so this is the, the first section here is about Buddha. And I, my mother was an art history prof, we went to Europe. And so I saw a lot of cathedrals. So I lot, saw a lot of stainless, stained glass windows with pictures of Jesus, Jesus life and Old Testament prophets and all that stuff. So we do have that, but this is the Buddha version. And there's a story there are all these legend, right? What was what was Buddha's previous incarnation? So there was a story that he had been a goat and he had saved the sheep from these hunters were, were coming. And so somebody would see that, oh yeah, that's the story of Buddha. And this is the when his he was born, his mother's lying there and the elephant comes. This one is also right after he's born and he's being wrapped in the silk. And this are, these are scenes from his life. This is his mother giving birth. This is, um, this is the four passing sites. You know, he's walking outside and he's got to be shielded because he's the prince. Um, and then there's the, the other ones. There are six different poses with his fingers. And one of them is scholar. And this one is the earth touching pose. And um, this is another one of his mother. And this is him under the bow tree, right? He's gonna sit there and meditate and there's all the temptations there. And this one also. So when you see these, you know, and you see them, they're very common, but now you know, right? The story behind it. 
And do you remember when, um, at the end of it, when he actually achieved nirvana, Maya said, well, why don't you just die, right? Get it over with. You're in this ec ecstatic state of mind. And he, he touched the earth. So it's the earth touching pose. He said, there will be some who understand. And that's why he stayed on the earth. There's a head of his head. And so you think, to what extent is this a meditation object? You know, people meditate or they learn to meditate while they're looking at one of these um, statues of Buddha. This is, I think this is the teaching pose. And this one is the earth touching pose. Uh, and I was actually at this, um, I have really much nicer pictures of this. <laughs> it's in Indonesia. And this one is um, these huge Buddhist statues. It was in Northern Afghanistan and the Taliban blew them up. And everybody was so annoyed. And they said, why do you care so much about these stupid statues instead of people? You know, so, and there's the monastery. So that's just a few pictures. I, one of my students at Asia University lives in that, or used to live in that area of um, Afghanistan. And anyway, that's a long story, but it was really interesting story. So let me start here. <clears throat> And, oh, sorry, I do want you to think about these things. Um, keep in mind Buddhist, Zen Buddhist art. Here we go. Think about how it's painted because, you know, you walk into a museum and there's some paintings and you often don't think about there's a whole tradition behind it. There's a whole worldview behind it. You're, you're studying actually philosophy and theology in an art museum. That's basically how I started liking philosophy and theology was going to all this art. But anyway, so they pick, what do they pick? Um, the color, why is it the color it is? Think about the philosophy, the color, the design, the way space is, the focal point, the subject matter, and the relation between humans and nature. Um, after showing the slides once, then I'll ask you to think about this. How does it reflect beliefs? The belief in no soul, right? You're supposed to just dissipate, right? Your energy in here connects with the energy out there. And the soul, you know, I have my own little soul. That's the ego. That's my uh, uh, life is suffering. The cause is desire. The cure is release from desire, and then the eightfold path. So the goal is nirvana, liberation, uh, the belief that finite objects are transitory. And the goal is to break the language barrier, to stop talking about stuff, just live. Um, and, and you go through this conversion, this, and you actually go back and you're doing the same things you were doing before, but now you're in touch with the Atman. All right, so let me show you these paintings and I'm gonna read excerpts from uh, The Wisdom of the Buddha. All right, so, all right. Um, all that we are is the result of what we've thought. It's founded on our thoughts. It's made up of our thoughts. If a person or speaks or acts with an evil thought, pain follows him. All that we are is the result of what we've thought. It's founded on our thoughts. It's made up of our thoughts. If a person speaks or acts with a pure thought, happiness follows him. Um, that's the first page of the reading. So, okay, here's, here's um, what I think. This is what Zane, Okay, Zane, this, yeah, this, the light bulb must go off. He says, as rain breaks through an ill-thatched house, passion will break through an unreflecting mind. As rain does not break through a well-thatched house, passion will not break through a well-reflecting mind. So a number of these paintings have the thatched house and that's what people think about, right? Um, let's see. All right. 
here's here's another one there's a thatched house up there and then this one you see this man here and he's crossing a bridge it's an island and it says by being earnest by restraint and control the wise person makes for himself an island which no flood can overwhelm so this is an image for making sure you maintain your inner uh, tranquility. And also, uh, when a learned person drives away vanity, he, climbing the terraced heights of wisdom, looks down upon the fools. Uh, he stands on a mountain and looks down. So you do have these mountains, right? And so this terraced heights of wisdom. So that's another image that's implicit. And this one is about uh, the Buddha nature. So you're not looking, you know, this is not a visual representation of a mountain. Mountains are rock, but this is the Buddha nature of the mountain, right? It's transitory. It's uh, a lot less physical, but you know what it is, right? So the paintings give you just enough so you know what it is, but this is the, the reality of it as far away from your uh, five senses and as close as possible to remind you that everything around you is the Brahman, is underneath that is the Brahman. Okay, so here's another one. And another big um, uh, theme in Buddhism is the crossing. And so that's, that's, that was in the book, The Crossing. And you it's like a conversion experience. You cross over from the world of sensuality. You have this transition, this turning around to the world of the spirit. And this again is, is an island, looks like an island. And um, so the image of the crossing, this one is, um, there's always water. So the crossing is across a river. Buddha was also considered called the boatman who helps you get across the river. And if you really have gotten to Nirvana, you forget that there's a boat and you forget that there's a boatman. You just have immediate access to the inner Atman. And um, so these are the terraced heights of wisdom. There's the man who's made himself an island and he's calm, right? and he, he doesn't let things bother him. Um, here, uh, I really like these paintings because, um, let me make sure that I uh, rouse yourself, examine yourself by yourself. Oh yeah, if the Brahma has reached the other shore uh, in restraint and contemplation, all bonds vanish from him. Uh, for he for whom there's neither the hither nor the further nor both, he is a Brahma. Like you can get to the point where that's just one more distinction. Um, the, the Brahma meditates alone in the forest so that you have these Brahma meditating alone. Um, let's see. All right. And then I had another quote about reaching the other shore. But what's interesting to me is if you look at this, this, let's call it a woman, because who cares and who knows? Um, so her body is the shape of this rock over here to the left. And her stick, her walking stick, is the shape of this tree over here, right? So totally fits in um, and is on the island and meditating. Um, this is another one where her body is very much a shape very similar to the rocks. And then she has this stick. And that is the same line is sort of repeated up here in the stick. Um, all right. And this one, the birds got cut off. So I was trying to get pictures of the uh, birds, the Buddha nature of birds. And I will, there they are. Okay. Took me a while. This is early on when I was doing this with uh, uh, PowerPoints. 
Um, so there's the Buddha nature. Like you know what it is, but you know you're not supposed to be focusing your senses. You're just supposed to know that that creature is a piece of the Brahma. And my favorite are the mice. I think they're so cute. But if you look at, you know, what the guy, the woman or man actually painted, you know, if you took each line separately, you'd say, how does that, how does that work? Because your mind, right, projects what you know onto it. Everybody knows, you know, what it is of. But when the person created it, you can imagine they just put a few lines here and a few lines there. Um, so there they are again. And then there's the lotus, because the lotus is a very uh, sacred symbol. Buddha was sitting on the lotus. Um, uh, his first sermon was a lotus sermon. He just held out a lotus. And the flower, the poorest person around who just picks up old flowers and tries to sell them so he doesn't starve, he was the person who understood the you know, what Buddha was getting at is you just see things differently, which is for what they really are. This is a Zen Buddhist garden. And you should notice a Zen Buddhist garden. There's a beautiful one in St. Louis, if you're ever there. Looks like a Zen Buddhist painting, <laughs> right? It's designed. So there's similarities. Now, why? It's because the image in the painting and the garden are a visual uh, projected image of the infinite within. So you have layers and layers and layers of depth in these pictures and in the garden, because you have layers and layers of depth inside of you. So it's supposed to be a metaphorical or visual uh, image of what's inside of you and all the layers to cut through to get finally to the Atman. And there's another Buddhist garden. Um, oh, and there's another one where you can see the rocks. That even looks more like a painting. You guys could find something online way better than this. Um, I just run out of energy sometimes. And of course, I have so many things and so many classes that I decide to move on. I write something new. Um, okay. So I'm going to everybody's got a clock in what did you think of that artwork colin um i like the style of the artwork like i'm trying to get it to load the i'm blanking on the name of the house but i thought that one was pretty cool i not roof yes okay um I said something about that house. I'm blanking on what it said. Oh, um, the house being broken kind of gives like a better sense of like the world to those people. I thought that was like kind of cool from the video. Okay. And I really like enjoyed the like look of it. Um, yeah, so you can think about the power of symbolism, right? So the cross to a Christian, that's symbolic, and it often punches some button inside of them, right? Um, but for this, so that thatched roof would, would punch, you know, a button, a Buddhist would think, well, yeah, I, I want to be like that well-thatched roof, right? Um, and then you can also, when you respond, you can think about what, what is it about the art, the color, the design, the way space is presented, a focal point? I mean, what I'm getting at, right, it's not very colorful because it's not, it doesn't want to appeal to your immediate senses. The design and the space, the space is infinite space, right? And there isn't any one focal point because it doesn't want you to look at it, you know, it's not like a material thing. It wants to kind of blow your brain <laughs> and get you past language. Um, the subject matter is all symbolic, right? Climbing the terrace of wisdom. So the mountains are symbols of you climbing. And the depth is a symbol of what's inside of you. 
and the everything is symbolic. Um, and then the relation between nature and culture um, is clearly this one of as much integration as you can get. There's no soul, right? You're not supposed to be thinking about yourself. You're supposed to be just, you know, liberated from all of that. Um, how is it related to releasing yourself from desire and um, being liberated? And then um, Anika, finite objects are transitory, right? So it takes these objects and paints them in a way that says, yeah, but they what they really are is just the Buddha nature and it's beyond language. Um, does that make sense to you, Colin? Yes, ma'am, it does. Okay, so someday you promised me you're gonna go to an art museum because you'll be doing a lab in some big city and it will have one. And you have to check out the, the Zen Buddhist painting and send me an email and say, okay, Dr. Beck, I did it. So what? <laughs> well, I'll let you know. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ryan, what about you? I would say I like it because I also, um, I, I like to look at like symbolism a lot and like symbols and kind of relate it to like what's the deeper meaning. So I thought that was kind of cool as like a, like a hidden meaning behind something. Um, I also like the idea of like the art portraying the idea that our realities is what we make it and what, what our mind already um, is filled with is kind of what we, how we will perceive things. And I think that's really cool. And an artist is trying to get you to see things in a certain way, right? Yeah. Um, so Ryan, you know what I think would be really interesting? It would be a kind of fusion art, right? Because everybody knows about these other cultures. So if you took the indigenous culture in Hawaii and some artist wanted to sort of integrate their own cultural tradition of culture and nature and then add some Zen Buddhist, you know, properties just to, to make it international. Like we all have these issues. Does that make sense to you, Ryan? Yeah, that'd be cool. There is a lot of fusion art around there. I think that's the coolest actually, because it's creative. What? Hawaii is really good with like mixing like culture. Like, like we have a lot of like tourists that come, but we also have like a lot of like different influences, like especially like with the eight, like a lot, we have a lot of like Asian tourists. So like a lot of their culture is mixed in a lot of Japanese, like for example, my dad is 100% Japanese and that's like really common here. And so there's like a lot of um, mixing which of culture and like even with food and everything. So it's, yeah, Hawaii is like a melting pot of like different cultures. And Buddhism had an influence in Japan, right? It's a combination of Confucius, Buddhists and Shinto. Um, Anyway, so here's Alyssa, which is good because uh, I, I live with these nuns and art is huge among Benedictines. So the difference between Buddhist art and Catholic art is really strong to me. So much of what you've shown us heavily involves nature, solidifying how connected we should be with the earth. On the other hand, Christian art strongly stays within churches. I feel like showing the world as your place of worship versus how church-based Christian art is further connects people with their spirituality and the world around them. Um, let's see, showing the world, I'm not quite sure what you mean, showing the world as your place of worship, let's see, versus how church-based Christian artist is further connects people not sure what that means. You want to explain it? I know that cathedrals basically are like rocket ships to heaven because <laughs> they were built right in the middle of the nastiest, dirtiest, loud, noisy part of the city. And then you open the door and there's incense and chanting and this huge thrust upward and the light comes from above. And I, the message is, there's another world than this one, it really. And so that it is the opposite, I think. Um, does that make sense, Alyssa? 
but my friends, the Benedictines, actually, they they have art that links culture and nature because they're they're more into Jesus was a human being. <laughs> they're more into the incarnation, living out the message. That's why they accept people like me into their program. Um, Michael, what do you think? Um, well, I was going to talk about how all of it was colorless, but then you kind of touched on that um, as well. And then I was going to talk about how there is like a lot of like nature, but then <laughs> that is also what Alyssa talked about. Um, but I do have to agree with her. I think that there like is a is a pretty big focus on like on, on nature and like the world and the interconnectedness. And I, I, I don't know if I... Hold on. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I thought Alyssa meant as well. Was that like a lot of Christian art is like, uh, it, it's like heavily, heavily uh, involves like the idea of the the church. You know, the church being the this, which obviously the church is like a religious place, and I do understand that. But I feel like a, a lot of people that I've known on. Um, talk about the church as not the place but the people you know um which i think is not really how a lot of the religious art is that we see um yeah good yeah in general christian churches set themselves apart from the natural world right and christian art focuses in general on stories from the bible and things but jesus did have those parables like ryan I wrote a paper in college about that. Consider the lilies, how they grow. Uh, there was a uh, planter sower who sowed the seeds. You know, they're beautiful par um, parables. Um, okay, Zane, go for it. Anything um, else? Yeah, actually, the, something that I liked was kind of like the Zen Buddhist gardens and stuff like that. And that also, I mean, that ties into nature, obviously, but uh, kind of like what I was going to say is it doesn't really say it in the book, but it's kind of like how it talks about like keeping your inner tranquility and like all of this and like, it. I just kind of got the vibe looking at the garden is just like trying to be like keeping everything peaceful and like not letting your mind be cor corrupted and stuff like that. So, I mean, I just kind of got that uh, presence of looking at the garden and stuff like that. So I just kind of found that neat. Good. You have to get to one of those someday. Put it on to, your... I, go to Saint, I, go to, I go to St. Louis sometimes, so I'm going to have to try it out. Really? The Botanical Garden is right on the freeway. You know, you'll be able to text it. It's very accessible. And it really is world-renowned. I mean, it is really something. And it has a beautiful Zen Buddhist garden in the back. But it has a geodesic dome with all these. It's great. It's great. Right. Okay. Sure. Alyssa. Oh, she already clocked in. Alexis. I really liked the description of it. It gave me a really like of the art. It gave me a little like a minimalist. I would say that word wrong, a minimalist okay. vibe. Just because I think well how I see minimalist is like it's on it. Not you, phone. Um, sorry, I got an email from my other professor, so I was looking at it, so that's why she responded. Um it's just the open space and the lily is what really like what like caught me to it when in the description when it talked about how like because I love lilies and then the black and white because minimalist is all about like like minimum use of space like minimum like things occupying space and minimal use of like color that's like extra it really just talks about the color that gets to the point it's like is needed so that really stuck out to me and that's what i really liked about the painting okay so you could say it's minimal in terms of um color but mm -hmm. it actually in terms of space is trying to literally create infinite space mm -hmm. right whereas some minimalism just tries to have just i mean different. like minimalist is like limited things occupying space Okay. All right. Um, and then, yeah, you could say, what are minimalists trying to teach you about your psyche, right? 
How are they trying to educate you? Um, I do think they're trying to get you to flush out a bunch of crud, <laughs> right? Not be so sensationalistic in the way you perceive the world. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, my camera's off. I'm currently taking down my braids. So oh. this is what they look like. <laughs> I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, but yeah, it's the message behind both of them. Like, obviously, it has a message behind both of them. They're different, but it's still, like, I think of, like, both are, like, trying to say something about and under what I mean about they're your trying, stuff. They're trying to have a conversion experience, turning mm -hmm. around, right? They're definitely trying to turn you around from, right, the normal the, yeah, or unexamined way of looking at things. So that that's true. And but those are interesting questions, right? What are they converting you from and what are they converting you to? Um, so I like to think about stuff like that. Okay, so the next one is the woman one. And um, I hope I hope it makes sense to you why I assigned this book, because you know the chapters aren't that long, but they definitely the same patterns keep coming up. That's what I like about it, right? That all the religions, they have good parts and they have bad things. And, and for many of them, it's the same things that are good and the same things that are bad. They just have a different language to express it, which makes sense since the world is pretty big and each one of these cultures developed uh, on its own before we had mass communications. But the very fact that they did develop in these ways that are very similar is very telling, I think. Um, all right. So here's the, here's the issue with Buddhism. There are a lot of activists, Buddhists, but the question is, are the monk, is the monk branch of Buddhism too um, non-activist, right? And I don't know, it's an open question. It's just uh, prostitution. And I did say on the video, I don't know if I told you guys before, but I was flying in an airplane from Indonesia to Hanoi. And I was sitting next to this guy who's probably in his early 30s. And I said, oh, well, what brings you, you know, here? He said, oh, I have a friend and we come over and we drink and party and have a good time for a week or 10 days. And all of a sudden it occurred to me, I wonder if he's on one of those sex, you know, sex trips <laughs> that you can book and everything, right? He's got his, his prostitute, you know, as part of the cost of the room. And I'm just like, I'm sitting next to him on a plane and I'm just thinking, oh my God, I'm sitting next to this slimy guy. But I mean, the sex trade is huge in Thailand. Um, all right, so what about Buddhism? Buddha fought against the caste system and he also claimed, so this is where, here's what he actually claimed and here's what gets passed down in history about what he said is totally different. Um, he said women can achieve nirvana. That is so radical. You have to understand how off the wall that was in the way these cultures worked. These guys were so progressive and the way religions get connected to this very conservative reactionary stuff just drives me bananas. Anyway, so Buddha's aunt raised him. She was the first woman ordained a monk. And then there's the story that at first he resisted but his disciple changed his mind. I mean, I'm not even sure that's true, you know, but let's grant that. Uh, the first order of Buddhist nuns. So here's another example where in Catholicism, in Hinduism, in Buddhism, um, it, was, it, it was nuns that were really the most independent, highly educated, powerful, because they ran institutions. So I remember growing up with a stereotype in my head that nuns were just sort of these subservient teachers and nurses. Not so, not so. They're uppity women. 
but they hide away in their monastery so they don't get in deep doo-doo and they can actually do all sorts of cool stuff as long as the Pope or the whoever <laughs> doesn't notice them. Yeah, the nuns that I know, they're on the, they were on the previous Pope's hit list, definitely, Benedict. But they're like, they love Francis, so. Okay, what are the rules? This, these were written later, right? The scriptures are written 400 years. I'm sorry, but this is not about Buddha. This is their own agenda. They were attributed to Buddha, imposed on the nuns, forced the nuns to be subservient, can never complain. This sounds just like the Code of Manu. Um, so, uh, Buddha supposedly said, said that uh, they would ruin Buddhism. Of course, that's not true, but people grow up believing it. They grow up being told that. Um, what are the historical developments in Thailand? There weren't any nuns there. Men worked away from home. That's why there was a huge prostitute uh, class. I mean, there was prostitution is a huge deal. And then Max Weber, like uh, someone said, and again, this is the same thing that happened with Judaism, the same thing that happened with Hinduism, um, that there are, the origin of religious ideas can get can be or was tied to class and then you use um you just the poor folk if you oppress them enough they just are told well just believe that in the next if you just act like a good little girl in the next uh reincarnation you'll be in a better place or you know there's a coming messianic age don't worry, don't complain, don't try to make the world a better place, right? That happens in Christianity too. Uh, the privileged classes also, that they deserve their privilege. It's from God, right? And that's such a corrupting influence. So again, the, Fad the Pharisees, the Sadducees did that, the, the Brahmins did that, and now even among Hindus. So this is I mean, among Buddhists. So this is um, such a violation of Buddhism, right? Because none of this is science-based. You know, there's nothing in the science of human beings that would lead to all this stuff. But it's very cultural-based. Um, all right. So religion and globalization is that we're, we're exporting our materialism and our consumerism and people and they're getting their minds colonized and their souls are getting colonized. They really want all this stuff. And there's ways that literally they're forced into it with the GMO seeds. And um, okay, so the government is run by wealthy elites and they're the ones that make deals with the corporations so that farmers can't have their own seeds and um, they don't let people organize. Um, and so really globalization has not necessarily helped the quality of life for a lot of people. Um, sometimes, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't, but people move into the cities looking for a better life and it doesn't necessarily pan out. And there's a lot of things they lose by moving into the city. Um, all right, so there are needs, right? There's a lot of need for reform and there's need for, for religious activism. That's what the writer says. You need religious leaders to speak out because people will trust religious leaders and they can really call out all the corruption. Um, then there's the religion of the market that people start worshiping things more than um, the Atman, more than spiritual life. Um, it's not true that, you know, this routinely happens, but girls sometimes can get sold in exchange for a motorbike. Um, all right, Buddha's response to it, it's a great illusion, obviously. All the religions reject this kind of consumerism, but it's still being exported by people who call themselves Christian, um, and that's, that's terrible. 
So how are we gonna address the problem of prostitution? Um, these daughters are taught um, that when they send it, that, you know, they make money and send it home and it, that's their way of doing their dharma, their religious work is to help their families. Um, all right, so, so what are the options for poor women? Um, so the, he advocates um, education, more, I mean, more monasteries or educated nuns will teach women and get jobs in decent jobs, right? That's where it has to go. Um, but there was a, a New York Times editorialist who decided he's married to a Chinese woman and he was writing about um, prostitution in Thailand. So he decided to fund two girls just personally to get them out of prostitution, get them sent back to their homes, get them jobs. And uh, one of them, you know, she it's really hard when you go back because you're stigmatized, like you're never gonna get married. Um, I mean, it really is a terrible thing that happens to women. They have no options. And, but this other girl, <laughs> had a fight with her mom and apparently she fought with her mom and then she ran away and that's how she got to be a prostitute so he saved her from that she went home she and her mom started fighting again so she went back to prostitution <laughs> and then i was also in a fulbright thing where um somebody was her, her project was to help get these women out and um that was interesting she was describing there are ngos that focus on that and um, try to educate parents to prevent that from happening. Um, but I wanted, actually, I wanna entertain an idea for you. In the West, we have this view that, that a rational person calculates the most efficient way for their uh, means to their own economic well-being, right? If you're rational, you won't, you know, you'll buy this kind of house at this mortgage rate and you won't do it and you'll wait till the interest rate goes down. And if you're rational, you'll read consumer reports and buy this car and whatever. If you're rational, you'll figure out what your talents are and what job you can get. And, you know, you'll do all this. Everything is rational, meaning you're going to maximize your profit, your economic well-being. Well, I think it's a totally corrupt you know, and when people end up spending money on their children, that's irrational. <laughs> like, and, you know, people do like some cultures, it's a big deal to have a child baptized and you spend money on the baptized, baptismal dress and that party, right? You spend money on these parties and you spend money on marriages and all this stuff. Oh, that's so irrational, you know, they... They could save it and it would grow. You know, they're going to keep themselves poor because they like to have parties. It's just, okay, really. But here's why I think it's obviously corrupt. Is if you were a poor guy in Thailand and you were rational on this view of rational, you would impregnate your wife. And if it's a boy, you'd have an abortion. You'd have as many girls as you could have. And you'd sell them into sex slavery. And you'd tell them to send the money home. That's rational because that is the best way for you to make money. And that's how corrupt that view of rational is. But we still, consciously or unconsciously, how much do we respect people who get rich? right? Well, that's how they got rich. And then we, oh, but that's rational and that's success and blah, blah. I really think you got to step back. Um, of course, spoken like a true philosophy professor that, you know, my profession has I, the people who score the highest on all those IQ tests and making the least money of any other profession. So yeah, so, <laughs> like, you could take it too far. Uh, I should have been a lawyer or something, but um, anyway, so what do you think? Which comment from the thing about women do you, are you 
you know, struck you that you want to talk about. Okay, Ryan. She gone? Okay, Michael, go ahead. Michael disappeared. Okay, Colin. Oh, there's Michael. Okay, Michael, do you have a reaction to the woman article? Okay. Can you? Okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll so go. Okay, I'll go to Colin and then I'll come back to you at the end. Colin, what do you think? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, for the, where was it? I wrote a comment down earlier. I liked um, where Buddha was like explaining that he had to respect one's mothers and one's wives and stuff like that. That was probably about as far like as I got into it but I found that interesting because all the other religions that we looked at really didn't like say that openly it was what about the claim that women can achieve nirvana I mean that's the radical claim you can respect women in this sort of patronizing way I think that's also like a pretty interesting view and I like that view because especially like all these others they weren't like seen as equals but in this one they are it was very radical at the time um zane um yeah just kind of going off of that where it said like how women can reach nirvana and how like at that time that was like this crazy thing to hear but like how we said yesterday me and you like how buddhism is like it's trending to be the religion of the future. And I think that's a big key aspect of why that could be as well, because it's more inclusive and stuff like that. Okay, good. Hinduism even has a, a third way, a non-binary sexuality. They recognize not everyone is binary. And I would assume Buddha, Buddhism would pick up on the same thing, especially since it's consistent with science. Um, so yeah, it could be very progressive just because it's accurate. <laughs> um, Alexis. Can you repeat the question? I was glitching. I just, think I just heard it. Your reaction to the article about women. I found it funny how a lot of like in, like in the Chinese culture, they don't want women. They will like put them up for adoption or have an abortion if it's a girl but here we're at we're abort it's the quite opposite we're, we want women which is i'm not going to judge someone for what work they do you get money you get money all power to you you do what gets you the money i guess but personally i could not no i'm just speculating about a father that would do that in general oh, so i don't true. think in general i don't think I don't know if people prefer daughters or sons, mm -hmm. um, but you would gather probably sons because they have more capacity to make money. Um, but in theory, there's nothing in Buddhism that would cause you to favor one over the other. Oh, okay. I'm maybe I misinterpreted what I just speculated said. about a guy who's rational and that's pretty offensive. Right, you sell your daughters to prostitution. And yeah, I just, no, be... that's speculating. Do you understand that? I'm just giving. Yeah, I understand that. In the West, we have this model of rationality that's unbelievably wicked, actually, but we still worship it and think we're going to benefit from it. So I don't think that like we should. The rationality is the best course. Technically, yes, it is the best course to get to like the most money, but rationality is just so you're putting yourself up to as you're putting others down. And I don't quite like that. So rationality is in a sense good and bad for depending on which side you're that's on. why we have such a centralization of wealth at the top. 
right? Because they don't care and money is really sticking don't. to money. I've heard tons of times that a man is more likely to be wealthy than a woman is just because a woman is more compassionate and that a man doesn't have to worry about going home to the kids. A man doesn't have to. Do. And to me, that is false. Well, I mean, it's not true or false. It's, you look at the statistics, yeah, right? The statistics. So statistically, um, yeah. it's definitely true. But um, I don't see that as a bad thing, personally. I don't okay. see it as a bad thing to be compassionate. Oh, yeah, okay, I would say. Okay, well, and often the juggling the career and family, women, when they have little kids, they scale back right mm -hmm. and somebody is the primary caregiver um yeah but i mean that would be called irrational it's just kind of crazy really you wouldn't get married because that costs money you wouldn't have kids because that costs money it's just very bizarre model of what yeah. you're supposed to aspire to <laughs> uh who else hasn't spoken ryan okay um i like the idea kind of of like you talked about how like the women around like Buddha, like, I don't know, like believed in him. I kind of like that because it's like the idea of in order to get respect, you have to give respect. And it's like, if like, I guess the foundations of like, a, I guess you could say some religions like we talked about last, like last class or not last class, last, last class, like if a foundation or a person or whatever of a religion does not inherently respect women, a lot of the time, like, it's going to be hard for, like, women to respect the culture or the person or whatever it is. So I just like that idea of, like, in order to get respect, you have to give respect. And I think Lexi talked about that a few a few weeks ago or something like that. I think she talked. Remember? Yeah, I said that, like, I don't give respect unless I've received respect. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I think that was, like, an interesting take, like, because you didn't, you said you you treat people like with kindness, but you don't give them like the utmost or, or something like that. And like just the idea of like when you meet somebody or whatever, like I, I, I would say I moderately agree with the idea of like you need to uh, get respect before like in order to like give respect. So I, I don't know. I think that was kind of interesting. Okay. So in general, spiritual life should be very egalitarian. As a matter of fact, the institutionalized versions of religions are very unegalitarian. They're, they're class-based, they're sexist, they're ethnocentric. So that's such a perversion of the real spirit. Um, Tim, did you have a reaction to the reading for today? Um, yes, I don't know why, but my computer just somehow stopped working and I was trying to fix it the whole time. I couldn't find out what was wrong with it. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Um, okay. Let me. Yeah, because this is what it shows. Why don't I? Well, this is okay. what it shows. How about if I come back to you, okay? Because um, we're kind of running out of time, but I definitely down. will call on you. So we have one more article, and then and then Tim, you can react to anything. So, so far we've had three reactions to the art, to the women's article and to the environment. And so I'll give you time at the end to talk about as much as you want to. Okay, um, thank you. Yes, definitely. Um, I do believe you because I know you're trying to make it, you know. Um, all right, so the attitude toward nature should, should be kind of obvious that you really, you know, you're supposed to integrate. And so greed leads to famine, ignorance leads to an epidemic, hatred leads to violence. So, um, I've, you know, the Buddhist attitude toward nature is going to be very much focused on sustainability. And um, it's built into their theology, into their way of life, into their history. Um, and so they would say it was when the West came in that this started to break down. Same with Hinduism. So um, the attitude toward animal and plant life. So they have this, you try not to avoid, try not to injure life. So you have Buddhist monks who make sure there are, they don't step on any ants. They sort of bring a brush, a broom on. 
Okay, so there are monastic rules to prevent monk monks from injuring plants, and there are reverential attitude toward long-standing trees and the Bodhi trees, Bodhi trees. Um, so trees are sacred. Um, all right, so the attitude toward pollution, nature is beautiful, and the conclusion. So they would, you know, anybody who has to pollute in order to survive is going to be very conflicted if they're Buddhist because it really isn't keeping them in touch with the Atman. Um, so let's see, let me ask you what your reaction to that was. Colin, do you have a reaction? A reaction to... Um, the Buddhist attitude to nature. I did not get that far. Okay, um, Alexis? So I read some of it, so I might have, a, like, I might have, like, misinterpreted it. Um, I read that they, like, respect nature, in a sense. That was my understanding, that they respect, was that right? Well, in a way, there isn't any difference between me and nature, right? So if it's you respect yourself, okay. you respect nature. But there's no such thing really as there's me and then there's nature, right? So I read that right. I'm glad I did that. Okay, so um, I actually completely like, because I always talked about in the class before last, how, yes, God put, like, it's kind of like counterdicting Christian because yeah. Christianity, in Christianity, we put, we say that earth is there for us and that God created it for us. Right. But and God is substantially different. There's God over here and there's the creation over here. And then in Hinduism, we um we're equal and that we're coexisting. And I kind of agree with that, that we um that we should coexist with nature. Like it's there for us, but we should treat it with respect. So remember when we debated what is the nature of creation? Mm -hmm. Right. And so the Hindu and the Buddhist, it's just this great unfolding. They don't really care about the origin story. That's why, right, you're supposed to just stay in touch. Whereas in the Christian, the origin story is a big deal. And God is different from the creation. And therefore, God can sort of intervene in people's lives or intervene and uh, cause the Red Sea to part and all that stuff. So, um, so it is really different, and it starts with the creation story. That doesn't mean that Christians and Jews and Muslims can't have an environmental ethic, which they do, but it is a, a very different basic intuition, the way you're educating your mind. Does yeah. that make sense, Alexis? Yeah, it does. Okay. That, like, it's really eye-opening. Oh, good. I'm glad you think so. I thought so when I was a freshman, I took world religions class and I thought it was cool. Um, anybody, Michael? Um, yeah, so I kind of thought it was cool, kind of like how you were talking, they kind of view religion almost almost as an extension of themselves. Like they, they treat it, um, you know, the same, um, which I feel like is good because it's like, I'm not gonna say you wouldn't trash your, like your body, because uh, obviously people do trash their bodies. Um, but like, uh, I, I like the accountability that they kind of created um, in, in doing that. Good. Um, Tim, do you have something? Okay, so like what you just said about how like, um, how their religions are and like how they, well, it's kind of what Michael said, but how they take accountability for it. So that's pretty interesting because at least like it's like it's like they're self-aware. Right. You know, like being self-aware would be is better because then you understand more, you're open to other thoughts and stuff like that. Good. Um Zane. Um, I'm sorry, I had to go get dinner. I didn't really get to hear much of that. Uh, what was the question again? Well, did you read at least the outline for the Buddhist attitude toward nature? Um, yeah, I got to read a little bit of it. Just kind of, uh, kind of like what I said earlier, just kind of like how it's connected to it and stuff. 
I didn't get to read a whole lot, but uh, yeah, I kind of found it interesting. I don't have a whole lot to say though. Okay, Ryan, did you have something? Yeah, um, I was gonna say, I think it's, I think it's interesting. Like, I guess it's kind of cool because each type of like culture, like whether it's Christianity, their outlook on how the world was given to us, so therefore we must respect it versus Hinduism where it's like we're equal to it. Me, I personally don't feel like, I don't, I'm not gonna like, I, I don't think nature is necessarily equal to humans because I feel like we have, in my my belief, like I think like there's a true purpose for nature, but we're humans and I feel like we have souls and I and it just depends on what type of way you're looking at it. Like some people believe that nature does have soul. Anyway, um, I just think that regardless of what way you look at it, whether you think nature is equal to you or you think it was made for you, therefore you must maintain it. It's all promoting the idea of environmental like conservation. So I think like that goes back to the question we had last week or like the previous class was like the idea of like does religion actually promote like um you know sustainability and i think this goes to our question and answers it like yeah it does actually promote and not only one religion but now this is the second religion or even like the third religion that we're looking at that actually literally actually like tells us we need to uh, look at nature as um you know like high, you know like highly so i think it does promote it so the stereotype about the split between science and religion has to do with that class division where the people at the top um, are telling the people at the bottom, you know, that they're telling them stories about their religion that tries to manipulate them, right? Oh, we can keep polluting because, you know, God is going to fix it one way or the other. That's what the rich do to maintain their wealth. And then they expect the people who are less educated to just accept it. And then you have the stereotype, right? That uneducated people are anti-science. That's not true. I think that's a lot to do with this. Manipulation. And corruption, it, yeah. Corruption, like for, for greed. And then also like some people may have ulterior motives like maybe it's not even monetary reasons why they're making this kind of stuff up maybe it's their anti-religion or maybe they're just like you said classes like they're trying to make people against each other and that's honestly religion is honestly a perfect way to divide people if you manipulate it like it's so easy to divide people and that's like one of the easiest ways if so you think, think if you separate science from religion you can say anything because there's no evidence right <laughs> and um, and the rich get together with the powerful and with the religious leaders, right? The, the monks, you know, so religious leaders had prestige when they educated the future wealthy and powerful people. So they would all get together and create this scenario where you really abuse the poor and you justify why they're poor by saying, you know, it's your fault or don't worry about it. And it still goes on, right, Ryan? Yeah, okay. So as long as you understand that this is a difficult problem and it's not unique, it's not just one religion, but it is a huge issue in our day. But people in science should not just trash religious people because they don't care about environmental protection. It's really the rich that have manipulated them and not educated them. I, I think if you had educated people, they would know it's, it's corruption. Um, anybody else that I haven't called on or, uh, Tim, you want to say any more? Okay, so for the pre-class video, I kind of was a little like amazed when on um, religion of the market, where it said girls were sold into slavery in exchange for a motorbike. That is crazy. Okay. And again, I don't want to say that it's routine or it's common, but it does happen. That is crazy. That, because that is just crazy. Well, not only that, but some of these that. girls are taught that it's their religious duty to go be a prostitute and send the money back to the family. Yeah, and that's, they really, yeah. That's why I'm kind of like, 
Well, that's why I think uh, last time we was talking, you want to believe the pastor or whoever's saying it, but not too much to where stuff like this can resonate in your head and think, okay, it's okay. Like, no, it's not okay. You should not be doing that. You should not have nobody make you think that that's a good thing. That is not a good thing. That's a motorbike. Like, what? Right. Is, so yeah. that, very good. This is liberal arts education, right, Socrates? Mm -hmm. uh, think twice. Live an examined life. Uh, be fair to opposing points of view. Be patient with complexity and ambiguity, but then call it out, right? Yeah. Uh, committed to truth. Like, this is a lie. Go ahead, Ryan. Sorry, I just wanted to quickly say, I just watched a documentary like a little while ago on Netflix. It's called Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey or something like that. And I don't know if it was, a, I can't remember if they said it was a section of like Mormonism or Catholicism or whatever. Like, I'm not sure. It's one of them, but it was- What like, was the first word? Uh, Mormon or Catholic. I'm not sure. It was, you like, said it was called something, oh, Pray and Obey. Yeah. Keep Sweet, pray and obey it's on netflix like you'll search it like if you just it's like a religious uh documentary and it has like three like hour long episodes or whatever and it's super interesting it shows how like the progression of like where it's like okay these people are like oh i mean you know multiple wives the more wives you have the better um you know you'll be in heaven and then it progresses to blindly sending your kids to a place where they thought was a holy place. Or that's whatever. Mormon. That's not Catholic. Okay, so I wasn't sure which one it was. So it's Mormon. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, it was a section cross branch of that, and so you could see the progression of how the first leader kind of was like, you know, as many wives, and you know, people are like, mm, but then it went to like, you know, extremists, and then you could see how people blindly led them, but there was still like it progressed from something you know this bad to like crazy bad, where they were selling like not selling, but they were marrying kids that was 13. And he actually, I don't want to see the R word. He did that in front of other um, followers and he recorded it. And that's actually how he got um, prosecuted. That was evident. But, you know, it came, it, it progressed and it was crazy. But I just wanted to, that reminded me what Tim was saying about that documentary on Netflix. It's really interesting, but sad to see, but true. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's good. When I was your age, there was a Sun Yun Moon, this huge cult, and um, they had a, a real propaganda technique machine that they recruited. And I had a student come and talk to my class who had been a farmer Mooney. <laughs> and all the students were really, ah. Anyway, so, okay. So I hope you guys are all gonna camp out and spend 20 hours this weekend working on your philosophy so we can catch up. I think Ryan is 10 hours for Ryan. It won't take as long for Ryan. But anyway, so I'll, I do have to write a paper this weekend. So it's not the best time for me if I don't get to it. Um, and I wish I could give you more feedback, uh, but it, when it comes in really late, then I can't do that so much and it's harder for you to learn. Anyway, so um, I will see you. We're doing Islam next week for three days, and then we do religion and science and some corruptions about corruption. And the last day on Thursday, you need to present an outline of your final paper, what you, you know, because you got to get it done by the very next day. So there's a lot for you to do. Um, okay, take care. We'll see you. Have a, have a nice weekend, if you can. <laughs>